Today we're very privileged to have, uh, to hear Jane DeMosto speak about the research of the environmental sciences. Um, Jane clearly has interest in examining the complexities of the current and future events, uh, which uniquely does not discount the human element of life on the moon. Um, one reason we're so thrilled to have Jane uh, is because um, my course in specific uh, on art and exchange uh, definitely considers the environmental conditions of Venice as that relates back to the art and artists who work here in Venice. Uh, just to note a few of Jane's uh, numerous accomplishments. She received her graduate degrees from Oxford University and Imperial College. Uh, Jane's research in valuation methodologies. Can you? Okay. Better. Her uh, research in valuation methodologies for non market goods and services as indicators of sustainable development has led to uh, several publications one being The Science of Saving Venice in 2004, as well as The Venice Report in 2009. Uh, for the 12th Venice uh, Architecture Biennale this year, Jane curated a section of the British Pavilion, and that leads to uh, telling you a little bit about our itinerary this morning. First, Jane will speak uh, to us this morning for about 45 minutes, then we'll have a discussion section in which Stefan Antonin will um, lead that discussion. Then we'll walk over to the British Pavilion and Jane will guide us through uh, the exhibition. Okay. So, um, finally, it's Jane's most recent research for the Venice in Peril, um, which leads us to today's topic. And that is why the health of the Venice Lagoon has implication for the city's heritage. Hello, everybody. Um, and just to add to what um, was said already, is the talk today is just reflects my work, which is hard to um, put into any kind of compartment. But I spend my whole time kind of looking at things. I've stopped trying to value anything in <laughs> economic terms, but that's why it's so good that Stefania is here because she's an economist and she might be able to add that dimension at the end of my talk, which will um, merely be some attempt to explain to you all the kind of dimensions that we go down to try and understand the whole Venice Lagoon system and its connections with the city and the different types of information and research that um, nourish that. Um, so um, here we are in, in Venice, a number of you probably live here, others have been here for quite a while I guess, but um, not only is the architecture and the way of life so unusual, but so is the setting. And it's, it's really um, a lot of the extraordinariness about Venice is because it's at this delicate interface between the sky, the water, the land, and the salt water and the fresh water systems between, you know, with the lagoons in between the sea and the river. And the whole of Venice's history and future depends on um, that balance. And, um, no, sorry, I've done it wrong already. Here we go. So, the, the, you know, very early on it was recognized how Venice has this kind of conflictual element um, relationship with the water on, on some, in some le ways it's the thing that makes the city able to survive on, in other ways it creates a lot of problems not least this morning for anybody trying to, <laughs> to walk through the city and um, this is a kind of schematic map of what we have in Venice today in the center you see um, what people tend to call the, the fish-shaped historic center. And because of um, a lot of, as you probably know, there's the, the Venice municipality in, a, in terms of administration. There's the lagoon, the islands in the lagoon, 
there's the Lido Barrier Island, and, um, and then there's the whole area on the mainland, Mestre and Marghera, make one whole you know, administrative unit, the Comune di Venezia. And um, recently there's been a lot of toing and froing with the kind of language used to, to describe the, the, the two different parts of Venice, which are very different in terms of their requirements and administration, yet they're all kept together somehow. And um, actually it's wrong of me to call the, the Venice where we are now, the, the fish-shaped set of islands, the historic centre, because they say that Mestre has its historic centre too, so we should be calling it the water city. So there's that in the middle, then there's the various islands around it. The biggest is San Terasmo, then there's Murano where they make the glass and um, Burano Torcello, etc., and a number of other islands dotted around the Lido, and then the whole Mestre Marghera area behind it. And what's amazing, when you think all this kind of emerged from, with, in, to, amongst <laughs> the lagoon, and, and I like to show this picture, of, you know, an aerial view of the salt marshes with an aerial view of Venice, and, and that helps you to understand, really, you know, that that the Venice we have today is very is still very close to its elements as its origins. And you even see that in the urban structure of Venice, you know, the sinuous forms of the Grand Canal, the fact that the Rialto Bridge was built where there was, not only does the word Rialto come from Rivo Alto, which was as Venice, the settlements of Venice moved further into the interior of the lagoon as they became better and better at building and navigating through the lagoon. They chose that area to um, start you know, forming the city, the beginnings of the city that we have today. And the Rialto Bridge, which originally obviously wasn't like this, it was wooden, but they built it there because as the canal went around the curve, there was greater deposits of sediment that reinforced the banks and that was a good place to build the first bridge. And um, the bottom right-hand slide shows just a random old photograph of one of the squares in Venice. I can't even quite remember which. But what's interesting is that why are the squares in Venice called Campi? It's because when they first settled amongst these islets, they... Um, they built, the, they built the first houses around the tidal pools where, again, because of the um, greater sediment deposition around the edges, the banks were higher. So as, and then, the, you know, because they built the houses around, they, they, they blocked the tidal exchange with the lagoon waters that, and slowly, you know, these pools filled up with sediment and they became the inner fields for the city and up until you know Napoleonic times there were cows and sheep and goats and, and horses. <laughs>